Good afternoon. My name is Adele Blackett. I'm a professor of law and Canada Research Chair in Transnational Labour Law and Development at the Faculty of Law, McGill University. And I'm very pleased also to be a fellow of the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation that is sponsoring this initiative. Welcome back to the third session of Transnational Futures of International Labour Law, La Justice Sociale dans le Monde du Travail, commemorating the ILO at 100. Those joining us in person have braced Montreal winter in all of its splendor. Many of our session, most of our session today will mercifully be by video conference for reasons independent of the weather and yet beyond the control of our esteemed guests and appreciated organizers. We are delighted to be able to continue this session in a somewhat revised but I believe equally engaging format that I will set out for you shortly. Last class, we had the opportunity to take a first look at international labor standards and the standard setting process. Although the focus was on, uh, through the focus rather, on labor migration and violence at work, uh, participants could glean the dynamics, the dynamism, and the tension emerging through uh, rather different uh, initiatives that nonetheless shared uh, important commonalities in addressing uh, situations of historic marginalization and how transnational labor law can address them. Through these initiatives, we were also able to consider uh, how uh, they are navigated uh, by international officials with academics working alongside them. This session today focuses on the unique, heavily utilized, and highly influential, both historically and in contemporary context, ILO supervisory mechanisms, an indispensable complement to the standard setting that you saw last class. The mechanisms have, over recent times, also been the subject of some significant scrutiny from tripartite actors as well as from academic commentators. Our course today will provide the opportunity for participants to learn from two simply outstanding academics who have also been actively engaged with the supervisory mechanisms in important and I would argue complementary ways. We also have the privilege to hear from two stellar emerging scholars affiliated with the Labor Law and Development Research Laboratory who have also engaged closely both from an experiential perspective and from a scholarly perspective with the ILO. Now back to the format. We will have first a 10 minute introduction to the standard setting mechanisms with critical commentary offered by Dr. Maud Choku. That will be followed by two 30-minute presentations, first by Professor Emeritus Evans Kalula and Professor Julia Lopez Lopez. They will be followed by a 10-minute comment from Liam McHugh Russell. And then we will open up for questions and allow me to underscore that we can take questions from this room and from those following us live, uh, notably on Facebook Live, and uh, we have the capacity to take your questions and then translate them from four languages, so English, French, also Spanish and Mandarin. Okay, so first allow me to present our first speaker, Dr. Maud Choco, who is a member of the Labor Law and Development Research Laboratory here at McGill, and also a lecturer in labor law at McGill University and at Université de Montréal. Maud Choco is very talented. She is both an artist, an author, an actress, a member of ACTRA and the Union uh, des Artistes, Démocratie des Artistes, and a labor law expert. She holds a doctorate in law from McGill University. Uh, she is a member of the Quebec Bar. And when she was articling, for the, uh, uh, doing her articling placement, uh, she uh, basically spent her time at the International Labor 
office in Geneva in the Freedom of Association uh, branch, as it was called at that time. Dr. Choco's uh, LLM thesis also engaged with the interaction between the ILO's Freedom of Association Committee and the Supreme Court of Canada. She is published on this topic as well as on the collective representation of self-employed workers, notably artists. Her research has been funded by several organizations, including the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council, the CRIMPT, and the Fondation du Barreau, and she has published widely in Canadian and international journals. She's also presented internationally, Italy, UK, Australia, and Mexico, as well as in Canada. Driven by a desire to tell stories, she's also written several short films presented at festivals, including Trop Trop Tard, 2018, and she has uh, taken uh, important incursions into theater, uh, writing Trois Fois Passera, La Dernière y Restera, at uh, Espace La Rizée uh, last year. So uh, I need demonstrate no further uh, the range of her creativity and talent, and I'm delighted to have her with us today to offer some opening words. Thank you. Start by thanking um, Adele Blaquette for having me here and the organizers for the uh, incredible course you were able to put together. The quality of the speakers is just amazing, and I feel privileged to be one of them. So uh, thank you for uh, for, for for that. Um, <clears throat> today, my uh, very short presentation will focus on uh, basically one of the two main mechanisms uh, that are put into place. Uh, in the ILO to control the implementation of conventions and recommendations. The reason why I will focus only on one, um, which will be the Commission des Experts or Commissions of Experts on Application of Conventions and Recommendations, that I will call the Commission, commission uh, because it's a really long uh, title. The reason why I will focus on that one and not the other one, which is the Committee on Freedom of Association, is because we have the tremendous privilege of having the chairperson of that particular um, supervisory body, and I will refrain from risking to make a fool of myself by mistakenly presenting that supervisory body while we have that expert uh, with us. So um, I will focus on the commission of experts, and uh, the comments that I will make are basically to help us have in mind the functioning uh, and the role of that commission in our head, so fresh, uh, because I know you had some readings on, on these, uh, these supervisory uh, bodies, but maybe not as uh, detailed or um, descriptive as what I would like to do now. Um, so, the Commission of Experts was created fairly early on in the story of the, the history sorry, of uh, the ILO. It was created in 1926, and um, the task of the committee is to, and it, it was and it still is the same, to indicate the extent to which uh, member states, uh, legislation and practice are in conformity with ratified conventions and um, recommendations. Um, and the extent to which member states have fulfilled their obligations under the ILO constitutions and under the conventions and recommendations, so under the labor standards. Uh, what is important to understand about that sp uh, specific uh, mechanism is that it takes place regardless of any complaints um, against a member state, and it is undertaken annually uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, in order for the Commission to be able to monitor the progress uh, of member states in the application of international labor standards, the experts on the Commission are provided with, of course, many um, information. The first set of information that they have is the observations they receive from each member state. Um, and these observations are of uh, two uh, nature. The first set of observations are from uh, the member states in relation to ratified conventions. So the member states will send information on the uh, level of implementation of ratified conventions. They also have the uh, obligation to send, in, to send sorry, information on non-ratified conventions. And on these conventions, what they need to be uh, sending as uh, information is why the 
conventions are not ratified, what are the obstacles um, uh, preventing from ratification, if they see uh, any, and what steps are taken to be able to eventually ratify the conventions. They also have to provide information in terms of what the what is the extent to which um, effect is given or has been given to the norms or, or standards that are contained in the conventions, even though the conventions might not have been ratified by the state. So that's the first uh, set of information that the commission has. They also, uh, the experts on the commission, also have the benefit of uh, relevant legislation, of course, collective agreements that would be applicable, judicial decisions rendered in relation to the implementation of uh, norms and questions. Um, also very important, comments from employers or employees or, or um, workers' organizations. So these are, of course, invited to send information in relation to their uh, state. And the results uh, from any inquiries that would have been undertaken under other uh, ILO uh, possible rules. Um, other procedures, sorry, under ILO's rules. So the experts that are sitting on the commission are all legal experts from all over the world. Um, they are appointed on an individual and independent basis, meaning that they are not uh, representing any government specifically. They are there as impartial experts. Um, and the, currently the group is composed of uh, 20 experts. Um, the Commission meets once a year in a private session and uh, prior to the meeting the experts have the task and it is uh, separated amongst them in terms of the uh, set of conventions or the subject matters of different conventions, conventions sorry, are attributed to different experts and so they have the task of uh, examining all the information prior to the meeting and come to the meeting with prior uh, or um, preliminary conclusions uh, and recommendations that it would issue on each member state and the level of implementation of the standards for each member. Um, these are rendered of course in a written form and they take the form of either observations or direct requests. Uh, during the meeting the preliminary conclusions are discussed among all the experts, and the idea is to uh, obtain a consensus amongst all the experts as to what will be requested or sent as an observation to the member states. Um, they're not obliged to reach a consensus. They can take a, a decision by majority. It has happened, and uh, usually when they do so, they have the, a, um, the, the practice to include the dissident uh, uh, decision if uh, the, mem the member of the commission wish to have the uh, decision that is dissident included in the report. Um, once the report is issued, it is submitted later on in June when the General Assembly takes place annually at the ILO uh, conference. So when this uh, General Assembly takes place, the report of the commission is submitted to be adopted. And um, eventually, it leads to a written report that will uh, contain observations of the commission uh, that are sent to the government individually, but the report contains all the information. The direct requests are not published. They are um, available online. The difference between the two is basically the observations are generally used in more serious uh, or long-standing cases of failure to fulfill obligations, uh, hence the decision to have it included in the report and the, uh, the, the, the follow-up that is made um, annually with the uh, government in question. Uh, the report also contains a general survey in which the Commission of Experts um, analyzed the state of uh, legislation and practice regarding one specific area of conventions and recommendations. So it would not be possible to do annually the entire <laughs> labor standards review. So they decide annually to look at one particular set of uh, standards and they will issue a general survey um, on the state of uh, implementation 
worldwide, they are able to do that um, with uh, the experts based on the fact that because they are chosen from everywhere in the world, they have the knowledge of different national realities and legal systems. And uh, in doing so, they have or they must determine the legal scope, content, and meaning of the provisions of the convention. So they do interpret conventions and recommendations. Um, it is important, though, to understand that the interpretation that is given, so the conclusions of the commissions, are not binding. Okay, so they are non-binding. They're really uh, being intended to guide the actions of national authorities. Um, however, <laughs> even though they're not binding, must, one must not undermine the um, importance of these inter interpretations, recommendations, and conclusions of the commission, and not undermine their persuasive value. Uh, to that note, and maybe I will not have the time to go in detail, but maybe after. Um, to that note, the story, and I use the word voluntarily, the story or the saga of freedom of association in Canada, the interpretation that has been given by the Supreme Court of Canada and uh, to the Charter, to the freedom of association, and the way it started by closing the door entirely to an interpretation that was contextual, to recognize a collective dimension of the freedom association that led the Supreme Court initially to refuse to protect uh, freedom um, of association as including collective bargaining and the right to strike. That was really the initial um, position and eventually turning to an opening to the uh, ILO, uh, ILO's interpretation of freedom of association the Supreme Court of Canada was able to open up the uh, interpretation given to the uh, Freedom of Association to eventually recognize the right to uh, bargain uh, collectively. Lastly, to bargain, to, to start to strike. And that was done really by including or entering into a real dialogue between what was said by the Commission of Experts and also the Committee on, on Freedom of Association, which, be, uh, which will be this, the next subject, um, and Canada. And so uh, the Supreme Court even underlined the importance of these um, interpretation and the persuasive value of the interpretation given in international labor law, especially by those specific mechanisms that are put into place by the ILO. So I will leave it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Choco. And now I have the distinct privilege to introduce Emeritus Professor Evans Kalula from the University of Cape Town, who is, as Dr. Choco mentioned, chair of the ILO's Freedom of Association Committee. Uh, Evans Kalula is a chairperson uh, of that committee and uh, was previously director uh, at the University of Cape Town where he spent most of his career uh, previously director of the International Academic Programs Office and the Confucius Institute. And he held a personal chair as professor of employment law and social security at the University of Cape Town. His education was initially at the University of Zambia, the School of Law there. He then went on to King's College London and Balliol College, Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. He also studied at the University of Warwick School of Law. His research, his teaching have spanned many fields. They include international and comparative labor law, social security law, regional integration, and international trade. He's widely published and heavily solicited to speak literally around the world. It should also be noted that he previously served as a member and later as chair of the South African Employment Conditions uh, ECC, 
uh, from 2001 to 2011, and I can't underscore the importance of this more in post-apartheid South Africa, an institution that's been pivotal in setting uh, minimum wages and conditions for some of the most marginalized workers around the world, including domestic workers. And of particular relevance to today's discussion is the fact that Professor Kalula was a member of the ILO's Commission of Inquiry, as uh, explained by uh, uh, Professor Chuo, on the freedom of association on Zimbabwe from 2008 to 2010. Uh, let me also mention that those who have the good fortune to, to have met, to have gotten to know Professor Kalula will attest to that his truly distinguished career is paralleled only by his tremendous consideration and generosity of spirit. So Professor Kalula, thank you for so generously joining us here uh, today from Cape Town. We welcome and thank you. Professor Hello. Go ahead, Professor yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, colleagues. I should start by, first of all, thanking Professor Blackett, uh, tremendously for this honor uh, to join this panel. I'm terribly sorry that I can't be with you in person. Uh, as it happens, uh, it was something not within my control. The application for, for a Canadian visa, which is now in the process, <laughs> did not uh, turn out in time. But let me start, first of all, by simply uh, acknowledging uh, Professor Blackett. Professor Blackett and I are kindred spirit in the, same, in the sense that we were both mentored by Anne Trebko. And, uh, it's, 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 it's really been a pleasure to be uh, in contact with her. I say over there, whenever I'm, I'm asked, that in any kind of teacher's life, in, in some teacher's life like mine, now and again you come across a student or a young colleague or a younger colleague, uh, scholar, in the case of Adele, that is so good so good that they make you want to start all over again. And that for me is my sense of Adele. For those of you, I have just had the, the opportunity to read and the, do a sort of uh, a, uh, a cover commentary on our latest book, which is the out of this world. Uh, I think the title is Everyday Transgression. And that deals with the uh, domestic workers. A subject, incidentally, as she has mentioned, that is close to my heart. If my tenure as the chair of the Employment Conditions Commission uh, in South Africa, uh, I think if I were asked what, what I achieved at all, I would say it was in respect of domestic workers. They still don't have a living wage. They still work under terrible conditions. But what we managed to do during my tenure is uh, have them included in the unemployment insurance. And that for me was a remarkable kind of milestone. And uh, you know, probably the only achievement, uh, modest contribution on that mission. Now, colleagues, let me come to the sorry I'm, you 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 have realized I think Emily will have realized that I'm I'm BBC born before computers and it's actually my wife <laughs> who is a physician that knows more about computers than I do. So I I tend to, to fumble. But before I start I also would like to uh, you know sort of to acknowledge uh, Professor Lopez, whom I admire very well. I sort of uh, followed her work and, uh, you know, so she's the, one of the gurus uh, of our field. Uh, it's, it's nice to, to 
to see you not in person, Julia, but to, to share a platform with you. Thank you very much. Now, Adele has asked me for, uh, to give you a sense of uh, the supervisory mechanism, particularly the freedom of association piece, in roughly five areas. He has asked me to, to comment on the significance of the ILO supervisory mechanism, and in particular, in respect with South Africa. Uh, many people, I think some people may, uh, you know, forget that South Africa has not been a democratic country for a very long time. Uh, I suppose 22 years in the scheme of things, definitely in the scheme of Canada, no, that is, is hardly, uh, you know, it's, uh, a time to uh, build a democracy uh, to the extent that the South Africans have been trying to build. And uh, the ILO make, uh, supervisory system not only played a crucial role in the ensuring the advent, if you will, of freedom of association and uh, the respect for international labor standards, they held South Africa's hand in sort of uh, helping it uh, put on the statute book in terms of labor law reform and give South Africa what I consider as a comparative labor lawyer, as one of the most progressive uh, pieces of legislation anyway, which have been augmented, of course, by the Constitutional Court. Now, this started long before uh, the in fact, South Africa was uh, kind of sort of expelled. Expelled, I think, is the word from the ILO. In 1966, South Africa was uh, forced to withdraw from the ILO. And uh, uh, it was not until 1992 that uh, some conversations uh, started taking place and the changing times of, uh, due to obviously intense international pressure, the South African government decided to re-engage with the ILO. And the ILO sent a fact-finding mission, commission, uh, which was heavily kind of concerned with matters of freedom of association and trade union rights in 1992. And it was, the, in fact, the, that mission commission was sent uh, a prelude a pre to change. And in fact, uh, it set the scene for what was to follow later on. By that time, in 1992, of course, Mandela had been released, and there were negotiations going on. But it was the genius of the ILO intervention at that point that, in fact, they produced a report which I think even the then African government, uh, you know, got thinking about and sort of provided them as it were a re-entry point into the ILO community. That was 1992. And uh, that freedom, it was, was, of course, reinforced when uh, uh, South Africa became a democratic country in 1994. 1995, it's the ILO assistant, uh, the current Labor Relations Act which I've mentioned as a really a sort of uh, uh, a wide-ranging uh, sort of progressive legislation was enacted. And then, of course, the Best Conditions of Employment Act, uh, you know, came earlier than that. So the ILO was crucial to the transformation or to the democratic kind of progression of Africa. And to this day, 
Uh, in fact, uh, ma the first minister of uh, labor and social security, Tito Mboweni, who is now minister of finance, used to say that the, the feeling between South Africa and the ILO in terms of common purpose was so intense that every time he went to the ILO, uh, he would be greeted warmly and embraced by the, the director general of the ILO. And that uh, was just indication of how much the ILO labor setting monitoring uh, system has affected South Africa positively. So that's just by, by open us in terms of South Africa. The ILO supervision system, supervisory system, has been critical in ensuring that Africa not only kind of came back to the international community in, in labor and social uh, standards setting, but has been able to take place as one of the leading members of the ILO with the most progressive uh, uh, legislation. And I might add, because this is important, when I, when I touch on something else, I might add, relatively well implemented. Because, I mean, speaking globally, the problem, particularly in developing countries, not least in Africa, has not only been that, that, that governments do not ratify international labor standards conventions and uh, acceptance of recommendations, it's been implementation. And implementation, the implementation problem has been basically affected by two, two crucial factors. First of all, capacity and institutions, lack of capacity and good institutions to implement them. And uh, equally, probably decisively, lack of political will. And South Africa in both uh, those areas has relatively done well, relatively done well to have uh, fairly good uh, institutions to implement what they have ratified and enforce legislation that they have passed to, to discharge their obligations and also the political will uh, to go through with it. Now that takes me to the second area that Professor uh, Blackett suggested I, I look at. Uh, I will have this area soon. Uh, the BBC, what is showing here, is uh, where, where, where is it? Okay, okay. So, uh, please bear with me, bear with me. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll be there, bear with me, please. Yes, the second area that they were suggested to me is to uh, share a bit of my ILO story and involvement that has led to uh, my uh, current involvement uh, with the Committee on Freedom of Association. Like Dr. Choto, I'm a bit, Choco, I'm a bit of a, uh, a product of the ILO. In fact, the interesting thing about the chairing uh, the Committee of Association is that uh, on the, uh, the Committee on Freedom of Association is that about 30, and I got the committee at the governing body when I tendered my first report in November, is that uh, I cut my teeth, so to speak, uh, by serving as an intern uh, to that committee more than 35 years ago. At that time, I, yeah, I was doing character building chores like stapling and making sure that the delegates, uh, you know, sort of labels are correctly spelled. I wasn't even allowed to sit in the, uh, you know, in the, in the committee, and you know, so it's, uh, except to come in up and up. And uh, the other thing is that the committee on freedom of association is as old as I am. The committee was created in 1952, but it did not start 
is work until 1952, which is when I was born. So I told the, my colleagues and government committee that I've come of age, that I am able to chair the, uh, the committee. So my involvement with the ILO goes back, and my story was that uh, I served as, uh, as an intern there in the early 80s, and then eventually of, uh, went to finish a doctorate, and then uh, sort of uh, became an academic of source, but academic, I think, and this I, I claim no credit for, and uh, uh, credit an uh, academic, I think, who in the nature, in my, in my view, of labor and the social security has got to be hands-on. And it is more the hands-on that the ILO helped me to develop and enhance uh, leading to, uh, to this point. I have worked extensively uh, with the ILO in Southern Africa and in South Africa, basically mostly in labor law reform, looking at the, uh, the, the various roles of various countries and the, trying to reform them in the image of international labor standards. Because I must mention again that the problem uh, in most countries is not the ratification of uh, international conventions and acceptance of recommendations, it is rather implementation. And there are countries, I mean, one of the, if I may just digress, one of the countries in Southern Africa, and I've mentioned it by name, uh, because I've done this, uh, even the ILO, Estini, which was previously called Swaziland. And uh, the Professor Blackett mentioned my, my Zimbabwe, my membership of the Zimbabwe Commission of Inquiry. I was, in 2017, sent to, to a Shutini when they had lost their Agoa rights. You know the Africa Growth Opportunities Act. And uh, to go and help them sort out the the law on freedom of association and how they treated labor rights. And uh, Esutini, I mentioned that, because if you take in Southern Africa, they have ratified probably, the, uh, it's not probably, they have ratified more conventions than anybody else in Southern Africa. And they have, arguably, they have put the worst record in terms of implementation of those uh, uh, was, uh, standards in, in repeated kind of appearances under paragraph three. Dr. Chok will know what, what, what it's about with Committee of Experts, uh, the International uh, Labor, uh, uh, Labor Conference Committee on the Application of Standards. So the, the thing is that uh, the impediments to the application of international uh, labor standards often lies in the capacity and the lack of uh, political will. And that, uh, you know, has seen uh, quite a bit of, of my time as, as sort of I've spent a number of years, in fact, many years in Southern Africa helping countries uh, after uh, their labor legislation, of course, advising on various facets of of implementation. That's my my story with the uh, with the ILO. I consider myself a product, a critical product, okay? not simply an abiding uh, product of the ILO. Um, I am very, I'm quite critical of some of the shortcomings, particularly now when people are even, uh, uh, you know, sort of talking of the ILO being in, in a crisis. Incidentally, uh, the ILO became uh, 100 years old this month. I think it was on the, was that on the uh, 12th or 11th of, of January, I think. They have been around for a uh, 100 years, and they are entering the second century. And that, I, I would suggest, has been a mixed blessing for them. Because if you look, we will take freedom of association. 
and collective bargaining. The, the founding, and this is, by the way, the so-called original ILO, Freedom of Association and Collective Bargaining, even though the supervisory system did not come until 1951. The, the sort of the founding of norms and of, uh, of, of that was in fact at the people for it was at the behest how much uh, for 15 minutes put on. <laughs> Thank you, I'll, I'll add it to it. Uh, you know, so the people forgot that the founding of the, the ILO was, uh, in terms of support, actually drew support, uh, not exclusively from workers who were on the margins, much more on the margins than they are today, but from very progressive industrialists. Now, coming to the freedom of association and how I see it, that atmosphere has changed. The freedom of association, very quickly, it is unlike the committee of experts. It's a tripartite uh, committee. It consists of nine uh, titular members representing workers, government, and employers, and nine deputy members. In effect, the you know 18 seat. They sit as an, uh, a committee of 18, and I am the independent chair. And uh, unlike my colleagues, I. I sort of uh, did, I envy my colleagues in the Committee of Experts where they can argue among themselves. Uh, my role as chair of the Committee on Freedom of Association is to obtain consensus, knock down to people's heads, uh, and sort of until we, we reach a consensus. This is my first session, which, uh, you know, luckily went quite well because I was able to. Uh, to steer, as it were, the committee to agreement on the 24 cases we looked at, uh, initially consisted of 165 cases. And uh, eventually, through the sort of the filtering mechanism in terms of a very strict criteria, we came down to 30 and 24, and then agreed on that. Incidentally, Canada has got a pending case and that the regard, believe it or not, is being brought by ego practitioners who are complaining they are not, they are not given their full freedom of, of association and collect bargaining rights. And, uh, but most of the, uh, the, the complaints, because it operates by complaints in where typically the trade unions or international confederation of unions who sort of, who, uh, large complaints the ILO after the exhaustion of, uh, of local remedies, national remedies. Uh, it, it typically, the majority of those cases are from Latin America and the Caribbean. And that is a, a, an issue that is pending before the, uh, uh, the governing body. In fact, uh, when I was presenting my report, I was summoned after the report was accepted by the Latin American and Caribbean group to explain myself as to why there were over 90% of the cases uh, coming from Latin America. And then, of course, uh, the, my response to this is that I would love, my people would love to have uh, much less uh, complaints, but it's a question of what extent social data of taking place in there. So that's basically what the, uh, the, the Committee on Freedom of Association does. Like the Committee of Experts, it makes recommendations to the governing body. Also, unlike the Committee of Experts, it recommends to the, uh, the, uh, the, the International Labor Conference, the Committee on the Application of the Standards, the Committee on Freedom of Association re reports to the governing body. And the, the report uh, is on the website, the latest report. You can go and uh, look through it if you wish. And uh, what basically, in keeping, in, in uh, sort of as with the committee of experts, the sanction is no more than uh, persuasion. And you, of course, persuasion uh, sort of by naming, if you will. And until now, 
Ten minutes. Okay, thank you. Until now, until now, that has worked pretty well. It has worked pretty well. But let me go through this very quickly because one of the areas I was asked is to reflect on what lies ahead for the I.O. in the second sector. The multilateral system, as we, as it has been known, where countries in good faith uh, sort of assume obligations and then do their utmost to the start, those uh, obligations are somewhat changed. There is uh, uh, internationally, globally, a, a crisis in, in the multilateral system where countries particularly much more powerful countries economically, uh, some of them are reluctant to, to go along. And this is uh, the, uh, the ILO is no exception. Committee on Freedom of Association is no exception. Except for this, that unlike the Committee of Experts, which are considered uh, sort of ratified conventions, we, the, the mandate of the Committee on, on Freedom of Association, fights everybody, regardless of whether they have ratified conventions or not. Uh, as freedom of association and collective bargaining are fundamental principles of the IFO, and therefore they affect everybody. The, the, as the sort of basis, as I said, of the original ILO. But that doesn't uh, mean that the people follow the recommendations from the Committee of Works. In fact, the other element that I should factor that I should mention very quickly is that in keeping with its, shall we say, foster kind of developments against the, the progressive human rights kind of uh, sort of systems, the universal human rights system, which includes labor rights and, and uh, international labor conventions, uh, the employers have taken off their gloves. I am, I feel lucky that right now uh, I may be castigated as Committee on Freedom of Association for uh, kind of not uh, for, for making recommendations that might favor uh, workers, but at least the employers have said they are represented there. They have more or less disowned what uh, Dr. Choto, uh, you know, referred in terms of the uh, the consensus, the jurisprudence of the Committee of Experts that was, has been built over the last century. For instance, in particular, they don't now accept, they have uh, more or less denounced the Committee of Experts looking, look, uh, uh, ruling on the right to strike, which they, they, I think they decided a long time ago that it was implied that it was the very basis of collective bargaining and freedom of association would not function without the right to lock up and the right to strike. The employers now have, have refused to sort of to accept that. In fact, the, one of the worrying kind of tasks ahead of uh, the Committee on Freedom of Association and the Committee on the, the, the International Labor Conference Committee on the Application of uh, interna uh, International Standards is that we now have to find a common cause, common ground in which to take us back on in terms of, you know, to reach a common understanding of whether what the wealth impacted the right to strike or uh, sort of uh, uh, opt, and that is an impossible, an impossibility in the current crisis, opt for a sort of the specific amendment of the Iron Constitution, which is dentally, I mean, you may, as a head of state, uh, Canada and the US, you know but how difficult it is to attend the Constitution. With the ILO at the moment, or the UN, other than when there's uh, the, the two-thirds majority would be virtually impossible you know, to, 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 to attain at this uh, point in time unless things uh, sort of change trust. 
So what is the future for the IRO? And what is the future in particular for freedom of association and collective bargaining? Those have been the basis of uh, sort of workplace, uh, organization, workplace, social dialogue, they have been the basis of work. But not only are they now under attack in terms of diminishing uh, sort of trade unionism, uh, sort of resurgent employers who think the ILO uh, is no more than just a collection of uh, liberal professors and judges and sort of uh, workers' advocates. It's also a, now uh, a question of uh, the ILO itself, what the future of work is going to be like. Because uh, collective bargaining was, I think, premised on the basis that you would always have workers organized uh, in sort of uh, workplaces and be able to organize unions and therefore you know, sort of uh, uh, bargain for, for, their, for their rights. That has changed. The number, in fact, I would uh, suggest that most of the, the member countries of the ILO, the, the formal sector on which that was premised is uh, fast declining. If you take South Africa and other uh, developing countries as example, examples, uh, in many Southern African countries, they are the, the formal sector is less than 10%. And decline, and uh, but the, I suppose the, the genius of the ILO's the, uh, decent work program is that it, it, it sort of it advocates the, the, the fair and progressive uh, regulation of of, uh, of work wherever work takes place. That is easier said than done because uh, how you uh, you know sort of organize in the informal sector. How do you organize workers? How do you organize uh, people in the month? That, that sort of, uh, you know, yeah, I've got no, uh, uh, no benefits that a, a union and the, uh, the workplace does. I mean, there have been imaginative kind of ways to do that, to extend uh, trade unionism to the local sector, but it is still nothing. It's been tried in in Zimbabwe places, it's better in Zimbabwe now, uh, you know, it sort of is gone backwards, very backwards, and the, I fear I, it's a matter of course that come, come March, we shall have a complaint in Zimbabwe in terms of how they have been uh, treating workers there now. So this is, uh, this is the challenge. The future of work has to be uh, sort of redefined uh, in the light of the development. But, and I, I would contend that labor rights, including freedom of association, will be central to that, no matter how it is defined, because without labor rights, the place of work sort of will be such a retrogression, might as well sort of give up on the multilateral system. So thank you very much. I have uh, uh, yeah, so the, uh, I, I'm a bathroom boy, as I keep, I keep telling you, Adele. I'm not very good with it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kalula. This was really a, a tremendous honor. And uh, in your words, you also uh, offered not only your uh, own experience and expertise, you gave students uh, a real uh, overview of the different kinds of ILO engagement and the interaction between the various mechanisms and uh, law reform and implementation in contexts that vary quite significantly. So thank you very much for that. It's also now my distinct pleasure to introduce another esteemed colleague, Professor Julia Lopez Lopez, who is a professor of labor law and social security law at the Pompeu Fabra University in Barcelona. Professor Lopez has been pivotal to fostering exchange amongst the community of labor law scholars. 
with her team, the Research Group for Labor and Social Security Law, Gretis, uh, they set quite a high standard for what was then a new and what remains a vibrant labor law research network when they hosted its inaugural conference at their university in Barcelona in 2013. Professor Lopez and Gretis have continued to convene a particularly uh, inspiring group of scholars uh, and visitors there. Professor Lopez has also been a visiting scholar at the Nanovic Institute of the University of Notre Dame, and she does this on an annual basis and has done so since 2003. She's been affiliated with the University of Rome, the University of Paris Nanterre II, the Institute of European Studies of the Free University of Brussels, and the University of Naples. She's a member of the steering committee of the Labor Law Research Network, which I mentioned, and uh, she has recently participated in research projects on precarious work and social rights that are led by the Working Lives Research Institute of London Metropolitan University, funded by the European Commission. She's been the main researcher in a number of projects, notably Notion of Worker and Segmentation of Social Rights and New Governance Institutions in the Work Arena, both funded by the Spanish Ministry of Economy and Competitiveness. And currently, together with Consuelo Chacartigui, another uh, uh, leading uh, scholar in labor law, they have uh, a project on the convergences and divergences of collective bargaining systems in the context of employment strategies. Currently, she's an expert evaluator for the European Research Council for the Fund for Scientific Research, FRNS, uh, all examples of the kind of collegiality um, and engagement she has uh, with fostering our labor law community. And last, let me mention uh, what she recently announced to me, the great news uh, of a new publication, an edited volume, entitled Collective Bargaining and Collective Action, Labor Agency and Governance in the 21st Century with Heart Publishing, which I, for one, am very much looking forward to reading. The title of her presentation is The Role of Supervisory Bodies Under Austerity, The Spanish Case in Context. Professor Lopez, thank you very much for joining us uh, today and for uh, speaking on this theme. Thank you very much. I would like to start and uh, tell you that I am very sad because I would love to be there. I love Montreal. I love McGill University. I think the students at McGill University are wonderful. I love to speak with the students. But the respiratory infection that I have for two weeks, uh, private, uh, the doctor private and I, I fly. Barcelona is a good place, but not every, it, the, the virus are globalized. This means that sometimes you have to stop. I also want to thank uh, Professor Adel Blanket uh, for this opportunity to share a round table with uh, Professor Dalula, which is a Master of Labor Law. And I want uh, also to thank uh, Adel Blanket for the possibility to share the round table with Professor Chobham and Professor uh, Lyon Michael Russell, because it's a great opportunity for, uh, for me to, to comment and to, to share the arena. One thing that I want to say also, it is that for me it would be impossible to speak for you without the help of Emily and Piper and the wonderful team which is in the floor, in the in the end of the, the room. You are wonderful and I don't I, I am not able to, to work with this sophisticated uh, sophisticated system without your help. Thank you very, very much. I am very happy to participate because for me uh, to to participate in activities uh, leading by other uh, blanket combined, she combined two things and for me are crucial. Also, which is here is practically 9.30 in the, in, the, in the afternoon. But a dead blanket is a distinguished and excellent research and also she's very worried for justice. 
And when you are 64 years old, I, you have very clear that you want to work with very good, interesting people, but also people who care for the vulnerable of the society, because this is a speak about labor. When a, 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 a dear professor Adel Blanquet asked me to participate, I thought that uh, this was very arrogant to speak uh, with uh, Professor Kalula. I, I did I didn't want to speak about the Committee of Freedom of Association because he is a, uh, he's the, the, the leading in this uh, in this uh, topic. And I prefer to concentrate more my my presentation in the Committee of for expert. I think uh, Professor Choco has done a very good job and helped me a lot to present my, my case uh, easily. The first thing is I, I have shown a PowerPoint because my Catalan accent in English could be helped if you have shown slides. But if the slides doesn't work, don't worry because you will have later the slides and I can have all the presentation in front of you. The first point that we have to, to understand, to work about the role of supervisory bodies under uh, the Spanish case, or in the Spanish case, it is the, that Spain has ratified 133 ILO conventions. And Spain has ratified the eight fundamental ones. This is very important to understand because the 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 care the center my presentation is more of application of the ILO convention that Spain have ratified more than encourage as a Professor Kalula mentioned other cases to encourage to ratify a new convention. This means that in Spain always have had an international curve to speak uh, solely an international location. One thing that is important also, uh, especially for, for the youngest one, for the student, is to understand that it's very, um, it's very important to center institution in the embeddedness of the historical situation. In Spain has suffered a dictatorship for 40 years. And this is important to understand, to speak about the other things that we will speak. In Spain, from the 1931 to 1977, was a dictatorship under Franco dictatorship. And this is important because part of the, uh, of the things that we, we have to speak about is about this. The scholar and son activist in Spain, I studied a law school and the dictatorship with the police inside the building. And when I speak, we will, I, we will speak about the situation, the current situation. We have to understand the institution have to be understood in this context eh, of, eh, of the repression during the, during the dictatorship. All the, uh, the, in my first slides, I will uh, comment about the, the the role of the ILO Convention um, during the Franco dictatorship. Also, during the Franco dictatorship, Spain ratified ILO Convention, the ILO Convention about individual labor conditions and about social security rights. This means that also when we live in a dictatorship. We have ratified ILO convention. ILO convention were present in labor law. Obviously, a dictatorship does recon didn't recognize collective rights. But it's important to say this because also in this period we have ratified several uh, ILO conventions. The second step, and we can comment in the colloquium if you are you think it's interesting because I, I want to flash some ideas about the embeddedness of the institution. The second point it is that the ILO Convention was crucial in the rule of uh, in the, the, the rule of ILO Convention was crucial in the transition period period. Eh? During the transition period, eh, the uh, ILO Convention was the masterpiece in 
to create the right, eh, the right to a freedom of association, the right to collective bargaining, and this, the right to strike. Eh, in a process where, first of all, the ILO Convention permit, permits uh, the uh, Hispanic citizen to recognize all these rights uh, as liberties, as freedom, and after the Constitution permits recognize these rights as a fundamental rights. This evolution from freedoms to a fundamental rights is impossible to understand without the ILO Convention, the Convention 87 and 98 of the Act. And also, when the Constitution was approved, which was a wonderful uh, moment in our period of life because it was very important for so many people. The Constitution recognizes fundamental rights in the article is a, a tweet eight, paragraph one and second, freedom of association and strikes. But there was no a law to develop this, uh, these fundamental rights. And the law was enacted in 1985. This means that from 1977 to 1985, in all this period, eh, the construction, eh, the, the, the way from freedom of association and freedom of uh, a strike eh, goes. Uh, help a lot the ILO Convention. Now we have a law, a very important law, which have developed freedom of association and collective bargaining. And this period was very, very important. And also, and we will see this later, the ILO Convention helped a lot interpreting the Constitution. And this means that there is a very clear judicialization of ILO Convention. And this has to be explained very clear because it's impossible to understand the role of Committee of Freedom of Association and the Commission or the Committee of Experts with the spillover with other institutions. Institution as formal courts, eh, European Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, the uh, national court without understanding this as spillover is very difficult to read all the all the frame of the embedded. This means that my first conclusion will be the ILO has been consistently present as main reference to understand the Spanish model of legal law. What happened with in the current scenario, which is the current scenario? You know very well the no, the current scenario, especially in Europe, in, around the world, but especially in Europe, it is a uh, labor law is and um, is uh, suffering a lot of uh, labor law uh, cuts because the austerity. This means that if we have to create in the current scenario a glossary. The glossary of terms will be globalization, but will be austerity. This means that with the excuse of austerity, labor law has suffered a lot of legal uh, legal labor reforms. This means that in Spain is one of the cases eh, that have suffered a lot of cuts and a lot of uh, labor legal labor market reforms because the European Union, through soft law regulation, has created a dynamic modifying the hard law regulation in the hard level, eh? in the national level, sorry. This means that the uh, European Union create a soft law orientation uh, directive, and in the national level, the implementation of this uh, model of flexibility, they call flex security, have provoked a lot of legal reforms. And these legal reforms try trying to answer, to respond to the austerity and trying to answer the question of unemployment and trying to answer the question 
of sustainability of uh, social security benefits. This means that there is a constant dynamic between soft law and hard law between European Union level and national level. The model in the European Union level in the current scenario in implementing the, 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 the reforms is, called, is under the, the, the paradigm or under the umbrella of the, the model called a flexi security. What does it mean flex security? Flex security for the European Union for the Lisbon strategy at 2000 it is that we have to liberalize the mechanism of termination of contract. We have to liberalize eh, the termination of contract because the, the firms have a lot of problems, economic problems, technological problems, and they have to be able to fire people to, ter to terminate the contract easily. And, but the, the, the European Union, in this flexi uh, security model, create a second part of the policy. And the second part of the policy is free termination of to ample, to uh, broader possibilities to termination of contract, but at the same time, create more employability through training and unemployment benefits for this means that the equilibrium exists in the model. There are two parts of the model. More flexibility, but at the same time, you will, be, you will have more employability because you will be training and you will be protected during the, during the, during the transition in this period with, with an employment benefits. This model works very well in Austria and Germany but this model doesn't work at all in Spain. And why doesn't work at all? Because we have implemented in different reforms in 2011, in 2012, different reforms creating more flexibility, internal flexibility, the geographical flexibility, all kind of flex functional flexibility, we have um, opened more the idea of a um, of a termination of contract, but we have not created a mechanism of employability and we have not created more protection for workers. And this is a disaster. And we have called this, some of my colleagues, we have called this the flexi precarity. Spain is characterized for the flexi precarity model. And I am not speaking about things that are not related with our story because our story is how unions and workers try to fight against these policies. And ILO appeared in a new way. All institutions creating a new frame to defend the labor rights. It's very, very simple. Eh? I want to, eh, to, eh, to comment with you that the two main points in the, the, the last uh, uh, legal market reform in Spain have been characterized because of the decentralization of collective bargaining. And this decentralization of collective bargaining is without coordination of the fear levels, then eh? there is a decentralization without any kind of coordination. This means that have impact inequality and no discrimination very clearly. And I have to comment or to add that it's important to understand it, so to say this, because in the supranational level, in the sector level, is where the uh, uh, union negotiates. This means that this process of decentralization is a process of this, this uh, uh, to eliminate the capacity of unions to, uh, to have you wicked unions. And because the unions negotiate in the sector level. They negotiate some time in the big uh, firms level, but more in the sector level. And the second part of this, uh, this story, it is that there is a strong repression, repression of collective action. Okay? 
the collective action and the strike have a reflection in the criminal law, have entered in the criminal law as in the period of the Franco regime. Not all the strikes, obviously, because the strikes is a process of deliberation and a process to uh, stop work, to push, to stress the uh, labor condition, the uh, regulation. But they had an article in the in the uh, in the pen, in the criminal court which penalized the picketing. This means that workers who participate in the process of a strike can be can commit a, a crime. Okay? This was this is a new uh, a new reality. This criminalization. Also, you know because there is uh, obviously around the world the information, all the protests and the young people and all this. They have enacted uh, a law to press protest in the street. Okay? And this is the second, which is very important. In the slides you have reference, I don't want to stop here, you have reference about the judicialization of the, of the, of the system in Spain. The unions, the two, two of the main unions, LACTV and Comisiones Sobreras, but the unions in general have judicialized the system. This means after 2012, there is a judicial section of the system because as they are repression, there is repression in the street, they go to the court. And this is important because part of the claim is claiming that the reforms have violated the ILO conventions. And the ILO conventions. And this is the, the third part of the story, and we can comment um, with more uh, calm and in the cover which is the rule of the committee of experts eh, in the scenario that we have described and I have described in the scenario of austerity. The uh, unions, the unions with no help of the International Trade Union Confederation, the major representative unions are using all the these super uh, uh, bodies. The Committee of Freedom of Association is integrated now in the discourse in the uh, in the course of like long, and also the Committee of S is used as orientation for the actor. This means that if we divide in groups of of, of, of topics, for example, and I do have all the information about this exactly reference numerically. Collective rights, for example, the freedom of association and strife. The unions understand that there is a violation of the ILO Convention. And to defend, for example, their autonomy, they ask the committee to ESPER. And the committee of ESPER declare that autonomy in the exercise of collective rights for union have to be placed without repression. Eh, without repression. This means that there is clearly, eh, clearly a defense in, in the in the committee of the expert in the case of his faith about how to defend freedom of association a right to strike with autonomy and without repression. Eh? The second group of this, eh, the collective bargain and also the, the, the freedom of association have been treated before the committee of ESPER and the committee of freedom of association and the committee of ESPER of, of, of the commission of ESPER has resolved inviting Spain or inviting the government to promote more social dialogue. Uh, is 10 or is, I can see? 10, thank you. Hey. This means that social uh, dialogue is, is in, in the debate of the Committee of Esper, consultation in the Committee of Esper, especially about unemployment uh, policies. Eh? Unemployment policies have been increased without any curve for the opinion of the social partner, not only 
the workers and representation also the entrepreneurs and the, the committee of expert has called for more statistical information more social dialogue more information about youth and youth worker policies long-term unemployment policies education and vocational training programs and how you implement this the second group first of all was the the collective rights the second group is a standard of living eh? the committee of experts when you manage the cases in uh, of spain have a have some important reference to minimal wage fixing about criteria to uh, fix the minimal wage to social security minimal standard all these are um, are um, in in the in the debate and also about maternity eh? benefits about maternity and in this case in this case in 2013 the, the committee asked for insurance sufficiency income for the full and healthy income for women and children. Okay? This means that there is other group of things. Termination of employment. Also, we have committee of expert resolution. And in the in the termination of unemployment, two important cases that I we have to, to take account. First of all, Spain has implemented a very long period of probation. And this long period of probation means that you can fire without any reason. And the committee of experts have asked information about why this. And causes of dismissal, because Spain has introduced under the umbrella of the fight against absenteeism that you can be fire also you are you are not at war because you are illness or you have had an accident this kind of absence count for the total of absence and the committee of expert is asking because it's prohibited this in the IRO convention of social security other things and um, the, the, the four group is a uh, which is happening with the labor administration and eh? uh, the committee of experts asked how is uh, the, the labor administration works under the austerity and uh, cuts of, of budget of public budget because it's interesting to know what happened with the inspection of labor the labor uh, local court etc and i uh, the the, uh, the important or one of the most important also to do is discrimination and eh? the committee of expert has asked a lot of information about this discrimination and about women discrimination and about discrimination for termination of contract when people have family responsibility family responsibility also, the last, uh, the last one, the uh, two groups are labor condition, holidays with pay, hours of work and rest period, especially in some sector, as transport sector, and occupational safety and health. Okay? This means that they are a lot of things. Okay? that the committee of experts is worried about this and the dynamic of this it is the agency of unions the unions are moving are trying the, to 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 push to press the government with this and the labor of inspection i will finish uh, in, i see your uh, your adele i see your speed i only have for a minute and i will do my, my best the final, the final remarks, <laughs> the final remarks, and we can comment when I finish. I think you have to do probably a trust question more interesting than my presentation. It's impossible to understand the committee for expert resolution without understanding the speed over with the freedom of association. And it's not only a committee, as because in my opinion, it's a mechanism also of coordination because coordinate the interpretation 
of the law. It's not only that IAS is paid, we're doing with a period of, of, of uh, with a period of probation. They are trying eh, to push Spain to shorten the period of probation, eh? or they are trying to participate in the deliberation, which is coming. In this sense, I think I see some parallels with the open method of coordination in the European Union. The open method of coordination coordinate and set some goals with a calendar. Eh? A calendar. And I think in some ways participate of this hybrid network. Also, I think the committee of experts is a global labor inspection in the same labor law inspection. It's not a labor inspection in the sense that we understand in the national level, but supervise the, uh, that the, the, cover, the countries have achieved the goals of the ILO Convention. And in this sense, I think it's very important to have the name of Committee of ESP because in the dynamic in Spain, it is done for the people, as me, we believe the labor law is pro labor, has to be labor. We have all the branch of a law to protect all the values. Labor law is about labor. Have to have different strategies in different institutions in an embeddedness with repressionists in the street and the, 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 the unions are challenged this very, very hard scenario. I open all these I am open to all these commentaries, and I don't want to finish this. Hey, the students, and in UBA, you will be welcome. You come to Barcelona. I will be there to receive and to continue this conversation because intellectual conversation is forever. It's not for 20 minutes. Eh? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Lopez. Uh, that uh, uh, discussion, uh, I think, paved such a complementary, uh, or offered such a complementary account and analysis of uh, the uh, supervisory bodies in what might initially at first blush seem a very different context, but in fact, uh, in a context of austerity, as you underscore, and with a history of transition uh, from, uh, toward democracy, uh, there's uh, a, a particularly dynamic role for uh, uh, supervisory bodies as they engage with uh, particular states. So thank you so much for that. Um, I now have the great pleasure to introduce Liam McHugh Russell, uh, who will offer some comments. Uh, Liam McHugh Russell is a uh, graduate research trainee at the Labor Law and Development Research Laboratory here at McGill. He's also a doctoral candidate at the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. Uh, might be missing Florence, <laughs> Italy today. <laughs> His dissertation is a genealogy and critique of the evolutionary theories of legal change that have informed and legitimated core development practices at the World Bank and the OECD. His master's degree uh, was done at McGill and it addressed the normative and conceptual challenges of labor law uh, posed by the informal economy, a theme we've certainly seen today. He is also a member of a global interdisciplinary research project on the firm as a global, as a political entity. He contributed to research on globalization and international labor law as an occasional consultant at the International Labor organization in Geneva, and perhaps he'll mention that he sat at Sir Wilfred Jenks desk. <laughs> uh, today he'll comment with a view to underscoring some of the transnational effects of ILO supervisory mechanisms. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I, let me just echo everyone else's comments uh, and the thanks that they've extended to Professor Blackett and to the organizers of this really incredible uh, colloquium uh, workshop and class. I'm thrilled to participate in this roundtable and especially honored to be included uh, as a participant among the 
eminent figures who will participate in the coming months. Um, the goal of my intervention today is really to draw on the comments that the past, the first three speakers have made uh, to provide a contrast and draw out some tensions uh, between what one might call the legal meaning of international labor standards as provided through the international supervisory bodies and the tra transnational significance and effects of those standards. So uh, I'll, uh, int I'll um, engage here somewhat with Dr. Choco's comments and I'll start with this, an idea, an, an international ideal of, of international labor law. Uh, I think that the the supervisory bodies that have been discussed by the speakers today have long insisted, and in my view correctly, that what they're doing is uh, no more than what they've been mandated to do by the ILO and by its uh, uh, constituents, which is to provide guidance on whether and how countries are conforming to international labor law norms. And I, and I stress conformity, not just compliance here, uh, since that's their, their task. There, there, is, there is some controversy about this mentioned by Professor uh, Kalula's comments in particular about th the question of, of whether they're exceeding their mandate. But I, it seems to me that they're continuing to fulfill their, their mandate that they've been given. Um, and as Dr. Choco emphasized and as uh, Janice Balache has credibly argued in a chapter of uh, the book that Professor Black had edit edited with Ann Trebilko, uh that task, that mandate that the supervisory, supervisory bodies have to express requires the supervisory bodies to express their views on the meanings of certain conventions and constitutional principles. And when you express views on the meaning of something, that inquires interpretation. Uh, uh, it, and I, I would echo here Dr. Choco's comments that, that the legitimacy or per persuasiveness of uh, those interpretations comes from the independence of the experts, the diversity of their backgrounds, and the fact that they truly drive towards a consensus view in the meanings of the conventions. Uh, it's true, and this was uh, mentioned again by Dr. Choco, that the meaning extracted by the super supervisory bodies of these principles and norms uh, could be corrected. There are methods of authoritative interpretation under the ILO Constitution, but nonetheless, within a margin of appreciation, I would say, and I want to emphasize here, that the meaning of international labor standards, that is their legal or international legal meaning, is the meaning given to them by the supervisory bodies within a margin of appreciation. And so I, I just want to put that on the table and, and contrast that with some of the, um, the question of, of enforcement and effectiveness and effects that have put, put on the table by uh, professors Kalula and Lopez. Uh, international labor law suffers from the same problem as other areas of international law, which is a perceived lack of enforcement power. There's this, it often leads into debates in international law more generally, is international law really law? There's no uh, sovereign to, uh, there's no state to make sure that, that law is active in the way that uh, certain legal theorists have emphasized. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I think that some of the examples that we've seen that we've had discussed today, that this is a claim that's not even clear if it's true on its face. Um, uh, I think that the South Africa example uh, uh, just mentioned by Professor Kalula, where um, South Africa was pushed out of the organization was a, a real consequence of international uh, labor law and the, and the, uh, the enforcement of constitutional principles. Um, there are other examples that can be mentioned, Poland and Myanmar, where even you could say the ILO was actually enforcing norms. More broadly, there's a long set of debates about whether to integrate labor standards into the World Trade Organization system of disciplines. Uh, and there's also the continuing integration of labor standards into and labor principles into bilateral and multilateral trade agreements. Uh, this has often been described as an effort to give international labor standards teeth. And I think that the the discussion that we've had today and the examples that have been put on the table today point to uh, this really interesting phenomenon of the way in which the effects of international norms and international labor law norms in particular have an effect beyond what might be called or understood as an, an enforcement. Uh, sometimes, too often in legal debates especially, uh, arguments 
collapse the distinction between effectiveness and uh, enforcement, uh, effectiveness and enforceability, and the effectiveness of norms and the effect of those norms. So beyond this giving norms teeth thing and, and beyond uh, the ability of the ILO to actively enforce it norms, there's also uh, what Francis Montpin in his book, uh, The Future of the International Labor Organization, calls the magisterial function of international labor standards. Um, another term might be the tutelary function or the informative value of international labor standards. Uh, Maupin's point was that international labor standards uh, provide edification and guidance to, members, to member states regarding the goal of social justice. His idea is that international standards provide a benchmark for members as he put it, providing a regulatory model to countries which do not have legislation in certain areas or which hope to revise existing legislation or lack a history of legislating in a particular subject matter. And I think that, for example, uh, both in the South African example discussed by Professor Kalula uh, at the moment of post-apartheid transition, as he said, it's crucial to the democratic transformation. We see this very actively. Uh, and. It, it, which we also see in the transition moment uh, that Professor Lopez discussed in Spain, that there are moments, important moments, where uh, ILO norms and the activity of the ILO bodies, technical assistance, but also the su supervisory bodies, have in a very substantive way informed the uh, approach of countries to labor uh, standards, labor market regulation, and the vindication of social justice and labor rights more generally. Um, the discussions today beyond this, though, point to two other ways in which international labor law functions as a benchmark or an, or an anchor outside of the mode typified by this kind of inter interaction between uh, the supervisory bodies and, the st and states understood as legislators. And Mopin kind of had this vision of, of legislators and the South African transition and Spanish transition uh, examples are both about uh, that interaction between legislators and, and the international system. The first, uh, discussed under the heading of ju judicialization by Professor Lopez, is the, is the often emphasized recognition of international labor standards by national courts, especially constitutional courts. And Dr. Choco mentioned the Canadian case as well, where an engagement by the courts with international labor standards directly, only partially mediated through questions of uh, ratification um, uh, have led to a substantial, uh, to given content to uh, constitutional norms in a number of, of states. Uh, and so this is a, a way in which the effect of the norm is expressed through interpretation of the court and the question of the enforcement or effectiveness is, is somewhat different. But the, the much more interesting uh, dimension to me, vividly illustrated through Professor Lopez's discussion of the Spanish case, is that international labor norms provide a benchmark in another way. And that's that they provide a benchmark for political action by private actors or political actors or public. In some sense, they're private actors in as much as they're not state agents. But in a much broader sense, they're public actors. They're members of civil society. Uh, and in one of Professor Lopez's paper that I, I don't think she mentioned this concept today, of, of conflict as regulation uh, captures this dynamic uh, quite well. Um, and the idea here is that, so, so rather than just thinking of state action, including legislative action, in its interaction with international labor law uh, as, as shaped by this, this one-on-one -on -one between national policymakers and the international system. Um, the, the picture that she draws and, and the example especially of uh, the fight against austerity in Spain today points to a way in which the, not meaning, but the significance, the, the substance, the existence of the international labor law norms emerges from an interaction between agents of the state, local courts, and civil society actors, uh, especially organizations of workers and employers, and with the broader de uh, democratic public. And that the, the effect, the content, the meaning, or I prefer this term significance, of the norms emerges from an interaction between those actors in which the international labor standards and the principles 
are playing an active role. That is, the norms are given meaning by the actors. The actors take their positions and interact with each other. Uh, and in their using those norms as a reference point, the content is given uh, structure. Um, so I, the, the interesting point here is that conflict, uh, one might also talk about it as social dialogue, uh, works as an active element of local regulation, but also as part of the regulatory matrix that gives international labor law effects, gives it substance, and uh, gives it significance. So, there, that, so to just to reiterate, there's this really fascinating social scientific sense in which the significance of international labor law, that is the way in which it exists, can't be pinned on to the meaning given to it by any particular actor, and certainly can't be identified with the meaning given, it, given to it by the supervisory bodies. But I think it's important to stress the difference between this complex of meaning, action, and outcomes as a social science, social scientific observation, and, the, and their meaning as a matter of international law, which I again think uh, is mostly can be identified with what the supervisory bodies, uh, the meanings that they have given it. And the, the paradox or the tension here is that the growing salience of these norms, their growing relevance in various contexts, courts, uh, conflict, uh, social and political action, the growing salience, rather than suggesting as a, that a wider view that the, or that the supervisory bodies should have a wider view, actually makes a narrow legal meaning uh, based in a model of state compliance or conformity with determinate norms all the more important. And I, I think there's an, an interesting tension there identified between that almost formalist understanding of international labor law that the supervisory bodies continue to promote and the, the idea of, of coordination and uh, that Professor Lopez talked about at the end of her pre presentation. So maybe we'll get a chance to talk about the tension and interaction between those two forms of activity and those two ways of thinking about the action of the supervisory bodies in the remainder of the session. Thank you so Great. much. <laughs>
has been achieved at a national level or at a judicial level, uh, but maybe not yet achieved, as Prof Professor Lopez Lopez explained, at a political level or regional level, which is a new forum. I mean, the regional level always existed, but it has a new connotation nowadays, uh, a new relevance. So uh, I would say is the question is it's an open question. Uh, how do you explain that the European Community, for example, has gone through this paradigm uh, or this umbrella of uh, flexi security? Although it is, it seems very clear for all the experts around the table that it it goes against the spirit of the evolution of these rights, you know, and how these supervisory bodies could, let's say, uh, adapt their work to try to influence these kind of political forums and regional at a regional level. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see another hand. Yes. Thank you for all of the, the speakers and your sharing your experiences. It's really been an enriching afternoon. I have a question for all of the speakers. Um, so George Politakis talks about flexibility as both a tool and a policy objective um, when you're looking at the, the different conventions. So I'm just wondering what the role of flexibility is with regards to the supervisory bodies interpreting the conventions or even by extension or more broadly in transition periods for, for states moving towards uh, democratic reform. Excellent, thank you. Okay, yes, go ahead. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So my, my question uh, response to what this guy asked, uh, and it's both for Professor Lopez and Coppola. Uh, the fact that employers have basically um, tried to override the community of experts on the question of the rights to strike and tried to argue that they exceeded their mandates, like leads me to some skepticism about, as much as I'm enthusiastic about the ILO in general and so on, it, it leads me to think that somehow it seems to, to reproduce the, the, the same uh, uh, imbalance of power within itself and within its own organization that, is, that, is, that we can see uh, within different countries where employers are far more powerful than the labor movements. And this seems to uh, go, go against it, its, uh, its persuasive body because if employers cannot agree and if the committee of experts is overridden from within the ILO, how can the committee of experts basically be as influential as, as influential as it should be? So my, I have an a hypothesis which I want to verify with Capullo and uh, and Lopez. It seems that the ILO is incredibly influential the moment that domestic the domestic situation in different states makes it influential. Either because there are protesters who use its provisions, or there. Are, there are litigants who use it, or there are courts who use it, or, or because, for instance, in Spain and South Africa, these are countries in transition, so legislatures are incredibly open to new ideas, and then the ILO is there to supply those ideas. Doesn't that mean that we need states to be as strong as possible for the ILO to be as influential as possible? If not, we have private power and the dictatorship of, of uh, corporate totalitarianism that holds sway at the detriment of the ILO. Thank you. <laughs> fabulous. I think we've got four fabulous questions. Thank you very much. I will turn to the commentators in the order of uh, their uh, presentations. So, uh, Dr. Choco, Professor Kalula, Professor Lopez Lopez, and uh, Liam McHugh Russell. Okay. Uh, I will not try to answer all the questions because otherwise we won't have the time and, and I couldn't answer all these really good questions. Um, as to, I, I, I will do it in the reverse uh, order. <laughs> I'll start with the very interesting last comment that you, that you mentioned, um, even though you, uh, you, you, mentioned, you, you addressed it particularly to Mr. Kaluba and uh, Mrs. Lopez. Uh, I feel I want to say something about that. So I, I'm going to tap on that one. Um, I have to say, unfortunately, I think your view is, um, is correct in the sense that it is true, and in, in particularly from the presentation that, we're, uh, that, we're, that we had uh, from the foreigners, <laughs> um, the, it, it, it is clear that in per periods of transition, the ILO has been really um, helpful in different situations. These two examples are, I mean, that, that's a common base between the two examples from Spain and, and South Africa. 
And um, if we look at the Canadian uh, case on freedom of association, it, it might seem a bit different in the sense that it was not in a period of transition um, in terms of, of governmental or as drastic as those two examples. Um, but it was still in a period of transition in the sense, that, not a political transition in, in, in the, the overall uh, government, but in terms of uh, coming into maturity as to the charter. It has been a certain period of transition in, and it took time before uh, the, the interpretation of the charter was able to, and the court was able to address the charter as it should. Um, so in, in a way, I, I do a, a parallel in terms of being able to, to get to a point where uh, the government is open. And it's true that if you don't have a government that is open, and it, it turns back to what uh, Mr. Kalula said the main problem is not is often not the implementation is not the ratification but the implementation and the lack of political will that comes with it that prevents the implementation in, in practice and in legislation and so I don't have the answer as to how to uh, overcome that that reality but you certainly have a, a, a good understanding unfortunately of it. <laughs> great professor Kalula uh, thank you very much. I, I, I'm not sure I, there are two, the last two questions I seem to have lost. It wasn't very clear, but uh, I got the sense about uh, the first one about the standard setting process, uh, particularly where developing countries are concerned, and uh, how that be more effective. The ILO standard setting has changed quite a bit over the years, particularly when it comes to technical assistance. They used to say, in fact, there was a joke in the old days when, before the word, uh, the word processor was invented, then, that uh, the ILO had one mode of uh, legislation for all developing countries and they will go around and sell it to all countries irrespective of what the conditions were in those countries. And occasionally the name Fiji would have been forgotten, you know, in a document that was taken to Palau or something like that. It's come a long way from that. On two, uh, two, two ways. First of all, I think uh, the ILO now realizes definitely in the processes of participated, that the, the state has got no exclusive right to write labor legislation, that there must be a, particip a participation of the social partners. So that is very, very strong and coming through now. The other strong factor I think that is improving things is the technical assistant. Uh, technical, a lot of where there is political will, and it's not everywhere that there is political will, uh, a lot of the uh, lack of Im implementation, the challenges of lack of implementation are due to, to lack of capacity, particularly institutional capacity and expertise. And the ILO, the International Labor Office, now is quite good, has developed uh, ways of helping countries in, uh, to, you know, to uh, to overcome any immediate capacity challenges. In fact, both the Committee of Experts and the, the Committee on Freedom of Association, we, have, we emphasize in all the cases we deal with that, you know, the, the office is open, both from the center, from Geneva, but much more particularly from the uh, regional teams and countries' teams to help in that regard. So, there is, I think, some attention of tele, te, uh, you know, tailoring legislation to the needs, specific context of countries. In terms of the, the other, the second question I got uh, was, I think, in terms of uh, uh, at the regional level, how do you, do you increase kind of impact of the implementation of uh, uh, international labor standards. 
And my, my sense of this is that a welcome development, and is seen quite, quite frankly uh, in the areas I'm concerned with uh, in SATEC, has been the element of uh, benchmarking and peer pressure. In, uh, they, there's a, and that, I think, uh, sort of uh, holds well for the future. That is very difficult. Is that a limit I'm seeing there? <laughs> is that? Uh, yes. Oh, okay. So I, I don't. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. There, there is. That is a possibility that you are going to have uh, the sort of the prospect of uh, peers, and this is what I I told the Latin American and the and the Caribbean group that you know a lot of this is about social dialogue based locally. You, they, are, they are able to benchmark, because not all countries are uh, at the same level. Others are doing better things than others. So that is a possibility. The other two, I lost, I heard something about the flexibility of uh, supervisory uh, yeah, mechanisms. I think in the, uh, in the Committee on Freedom of Association, we, we sort of we are very strong on that. At least we, uh, I have inherited a system that is strong on being, being flexible, uh, sort of uh, not treating all the, the, the cases as the same, being true to the context, and then trying to help uh, the countries. The ILO and the uh, being uh, that I did not get. I don't know whether to. But I think he, Dr. Choto has, has spoken to that. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Lopez? So many questions, impossible to answer in, in five minutes, but I will try my best. I will try my best. First of all, I, I am totally agree with the, the comments and the answer of Professor Kabula. I only want to add to the question about uh, about developing countries, the rule of ILO, then it is important to understand that there is also a global unions, and these global unions are doing a very good job with global agreements, not only corporate responsibility, they are more than this. Eh? This means that the unions have global actors too, and these global actors don't play only in the transnational level. They also play sometimes supporting the national unions. This means that in all this frame of actors, they are also the unions in the global level and the collective bargaining in the global level. Okay? And this is important for the developing countries in terms of a uh, in terms of uh, minimal standard, because some of this agreement practically copy the fundamental rights of ILO conventions. Eh? This means that when you have a failure of the state, you don't have actor to the other side of the table. And the unions in the global level, in cases of failures of the state, are important in terms of ILO. A centering my very brief answer in, in Spain, a question, the very um, a amazing question now about Spain is why we have to use the ILO conventions as autonomous preference. When you ratify a ILO convention, you have to modify the national level. This means that the convention is absorbed for the national legal order. Why the actors, the judges, the air, the, all the activists in social rights mention the ILO? Because the national level is not achieved the goals. And it's for this the, commit, uh, the commission of experts is so important. The ILO convention appears as autonomous reference to interpret at the national level. Eh? Because you can set and clear a provision that one year, as is now in Spain, because the majority of the labor contracts are six months, one month, and what does it mean eh, in terms of achieving the, the goals? And all the thing that is important also in your excellent question, it is that it's 
very difficult to answer your question without mention that labor law is more contradictory than ever, than ever because you have the European Union uh, law, EU fix in the Union Directive, they are protecting workers. But if you think in the Lisbon strategy, they are cutting, cutting rights. Okay? Because, for example, and, and this is my last, uh, my last point, if, because, for example, in Spain, the young people who are precarious, they defend their rights under the directives of the European Union. At the same time, the European Union has very protective directives in terms of a, 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 a precarity, but at the same time is sending eh, this a Lisbon strategy to terminate contract, to, uh, to eliminate some of the labor rights. I don't want to continue because probably the next one is you have to, 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 to see. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. So, uh, great questions. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll try and say something about each of them. Let me start with the last question on this, the question of employer power, the international system, and, and corporate power. Uh, so the challenge that has occurred to the supervisory bodies from the employer side at the ILO mentioned in Professor Kula's, Kula's presentation, uh, and uh, it's been a topic of much discussion among labor lawyers. I think it's, it's pretty painful and it's pretty disconcerting, but I, I think that we don't want to overestimate from that episode the power that, that employers or corporations have uh, when it comes to international labor law. The process has been challenged. Uh, a question mark has been placed over the validity of certain interpretations. Um, the result of that is that the Committee of Experts, for example, has emphasized the non-bindingness of its, in, of its interpretations. But I think that, as Dr. Choco put in her presentation, the key value to a significant degree of the supervisory bodies is in their persuasiveness. And I think it still remains to be seen whether the processes that have occurred at the international level and in terms of the relationship between the supervisory bodies and the ILO constituents is going to translate into a change in the way that courts and international actors, public and private, use those norms. That is in terms of the effects that I tried to talk about. Um, the second thing is, so the second question about the uh, role of international labor law in the regions and with the EU, I don't want to uh, say too much more than Professor Lopez has already <coughs> said. Um, uh, the, I would, however, to point to the strategy question, or how can it be dealt with, point to the work of uh, Claire Kilpatrick, who has talked to some degree and has a paper coming out um, on the way in which international labor law has been used to challenge uh, austerity that's in large part driven by EU action, including through the, the ECB. And the way I think that the supervisory bodies have attempted to deal with the fact that the EU isn't a member, they can't be a, the explicit target of supervisory activity uh, is that they, they've just tried to be careful of directly addressing the context in which national supervision takes place and being aware of and speaking to the way in which national action is informed in large part by uh, other international bodies, including uh, EU actors. Uh, and then when it comes to this question of flexibility, I think it, it is very much ties to provides a partial answer to the question of, the, of at least the what can the supervisory bodies do when it comes to developing uh, countries. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that the supervisory bodies are doing a, a terrible job. There are certainly, I think, historically been interpretations and approaches that haven't worked, but I think there has been a continued transformation in the ways that the supervisory bodies have approached questions of institutional diversity, uh, questions of progressive realization, both in developing countries and uh, and outside of developing countries. So, fantastic! I have the honor just to thank all of our participants for uh, really engaging discussions, complimentary uh, in, in explanations, and uh, I think a lot uh, for our. Uh, class and for those watching us live uh, to continue to think about 
and to engage with as we come back to some of these themes in subsequent uh, classes, including our class that will look very much at freedom of association in uh, two national or regional contexts, Canada and uh, the European uh, context. So thank you very much to each of our speakers for your engagement. And I must say also, I think there's just uh, a, an added personal quality that has come through the discussions today and the, the very um, clear commitment and engagement on social justice. And uh, uh, that is uh, very much uh, what we hoped. Uh, so thank you very much, and thanks to all for listening today. <laughs>